This is Iceland in winter, and this is Iceland's largest ice cap down in the southeast. Practically nothing is pronounced phonetically in Iceland from the perspective of a non-native Nordic speaker, so I won't embarrass myself. It's also rather hard to tell apart from snowy lava fields and lowlands, so this may help. I'll use a summer photo later on for the route. Anyway, quite a few years ago a mate and I decided to make a midwinter crossing, which is rather unusual given the intense, stormy winters the Icelanders have. It went fine for the most part, albeit sodden through due to incessant deep freezes and then thaws yo-yoing back and forth, and the snow quality made protective walls impossible. But then a storm really hit, damaging our tent, and so we arranged to be picked up the next day by the awesome guys and girls who volunteer for ISAR. My camera with the footage didn't survive a dunking, hence only still images surviving from Finn's camera. In the aftermath we had to deal with some deeply moronic and fictional news coverage as well. Anyhow, a few years later I had a winter season that wasn't earmarked for another expedition, so two friends and I went back for another go. We had a sizable Airbnb in central Reykjavik to prep and pack, and this was one of the rare years when hotel and B&B prices weren't comically stratospheric. I came up with a few systems tweaks from the previous attempt that I hoped would improve our chances, or our relative comfort at least. James on the right, who you'll know from other expeditions, and Brad on the left, who we met whilst he worked on a medical research expedition team on Everest. Budget conscious as ever, we made use of the long distance buses that run along the island's ring road, called the number one road. We picked a particularly grumpy bus driver, but after some light shouting we ended up with our sledges and skis safely in the luggage storage area. The south, and in particular the southwest, is the most volcanically active area, and you pass geothermal plants here and there. Our aim was to be dropped off by the side of the road around here. Instead of being softies and getting a ride in a super jeep all the way to the ice cap's edge, we'd ski across the lava fields for three days or so to get to the western slopes. On the previous attempt, Finn and I had approached from here, dealing with a load of slushy river crossings, but this time we'd continue off the end of an old 4x4 track and then end up here instead. Our plan was to go west to east, descend one of the exit glaciers and rejoin the ring road another dozen miles to the south. Perhaps this one, but we had options. We set off in calm, reasonable weather, and the forecast suggested that we'd have different conditions to the previous time I skied this approximate route. The time before it was mild, with a mixture of heavy snow, wetness and wind. This time seemed calmer, but colder. Very nice. How you doing, Brad? <laughs> there you have it, the sound quality from now rather dated GoPro cameras. We had to do a lot of slope climbing that first day. Initially out of an awkward frozen river valley, but then across wider expanses and between large rocky outcrops. The solid lava formations that will be impassable in the snowless summer months are easily skiable through the cold season. We wanted to pick up one of the summer only F road tracks before dark. If we could intercept it, this would give us good pace the next day to eat up those miles and get us to the ice cap itself. This was just the approach. First camp and Iceland was treating us well. Although there was little to zero chance of super jeep traffic on the track, we did camp a little off to the side. Imagine the ignominious demise that would be the three of us run down whilst asleep miles deep in the backcountry because we camped on a road. The trip was to be about a week long and so sledge weights were not to be an issue, so one idea on this trip that I've not really used since was to protect critical gear inside sealable plastic tubs. The sledge covers are not fully watertight and the tubs could hypothetically act as floats too. Anyhow, a calm, pleasant night, and to be honest, not much to report from the next day, just some more climbing up onto higher ground. We'd started down near sea level, of course. The next day, however, we knew that we'd need to make full use of the six or seven hours of light per day. A big blow of wind from the south was forecast for the evening and might last up to a day, so I wanted to camp with time to protect the tent properly. We went through the normal routine. Pick a spot, stop, and make sure we're jacketed up. Generally, we haul in just a couple of thin layers so as not to overheat, and camping time calls for more insulation. Goose down jackets are not good when sunlight is scarce, nor in potentially damp conditions, so we chose synthetic insulation. Heavier but effective. But you're wondering what we're up to. In windy conditions you can defend a tent with a snow wall, but sometimes the snow isn't dense enough to create good blocks. So I came up with this. Super light woven polypropylene rubble bags. Full of even poor quality snow, these will create a tough barrier and make a good anchor point for the windward end of the tent. It takes about the same time to build, but takes longer in the morning of course to empty and fold up. Anyhow, we got the five person dome tent up by the time that the wind grew, inside an oasis of calm. What are you doing? <laughs> Alex is uh, drying up my boot liner, because uh, we all have two sets of liners each. But we thought that um, it's, a, well, it's a good idea to clean out one liner and get it dry again before uh, resorting to number two. So to make sure that my toes are nice and warm in the morning, uh, because the first thing that generally ends this sort of trip, sort of trip 
scratches our injured uh, toes. I'm just making sure that these are dry as a bone. This was before I adopted the use of vapour barrier liners and uprated closed cell foam boot liners. Brad, how was the day? <laughs> I think this is um, there's a synchronizing issue with my light. Slightly. <laughs> I think one might be 50 hertz. It's just moment. mine. Hello everyone. It's really struggling to focus on you. I know it's focusing on you now. Woo! With dinner cooked and eaten, it wasn't quite time for sleep, as the wind direction shifted and we had to get out again to adjust the tent. The southerly had grown to quite a gale and showed no sign of abating the next day. We hadn't scheduled a rest day, but the next section was tricky with some gullies and potential drops, so we decided to stay camped that morning and see if we could make a few miles that afternoon and early evening. Hello Brad. Hello. This is Brad's uh, own tent. James and I are sleeping in our sledges. Yes. I've got the bags just to make it before. <laughs> it must be quite cold out there. It is. A little bit damp. Anyway, this is where we're sleeping. And this is where we're cooking. And this is where our boots live. And out there would be dragons. Or trolls. Is trolls? Yeah, I think trolls are the right thing for him. So we did that and camped again. The ice was not too far away now. Welcome to our kitchen. It's really exciting. Really exciting. We've got a ditch where we can put our feet like that. Almost like what people at home call a bench. And that's what's going to have water put in it. And there's our stove going zoom, zoom, zoom. And there's our vents so that we don't get all foggy. And there's Brad. Hello. I'm not sure what to say about him. I'm a, I'm a happy chappy. What have you got to say for yourself? Uh, 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 pressure. Uh. <laughs> a pre-dawn rise and time to strap down gear once more for sledging. The wind was far from gone, but there wasn't any calmer weather forecast for at least a few days, so we pushed on through the terrain. Hello. All right, this is the view ahead of us. So this is the volcano, which we've probably forgotten the name of again. Um, we'll call it Friendly Volcano. Yeah. And then we have a volcano called Brad. Hello. And then we have a volcano behind Brad. And we have, well, the sea. And over there, yonder, is Lekki, or Lekkika, or I don't know if I put in too many guts there, but anyway, that's all good news. Um, so this is about as good as Iceland skiing in winter gets, so enjoy! Large shards and mounds of solidified lava continued to jut up through the snow surface, which was a few feet deep. I'd chosen lightweight polyethylene sledges with removable sledge bags, and not larger composite ones. They weren't the best choice size-wise, as our equipment, whilst light, was still bulky, and we found them likely to topple over in bumpy areas despite careful weight distribution. It was on wind-scoured and slippery slopes that our dignity was at its lowest ebb. But this is not performance art. This is winter journeying. No room for pride nor vanity. <laughs> hey! I got that. I think I did that rather well. Yeah. Finally, sight of our access glacier in the distance there, beyond the rocks. But one more camp. I think it is, yes. It's our third camp, isn't it? And uh, we've got ourselves our customary uh, part of stuff here. And here we have Brad, who sorted out one of our sledges and made them all safe. <laughs> Hello, Brad. He's looking very happy with life. Because I'm going to give a guided tour of the home. Look at that. We've got a step, we've got a seat, and then we've got all of our snow that we need for melting the water. I so think we just camped on the crevasse, and then Alex has just gone to make it I bet After a long day on the trail. Time for dinner? I'm shattered. <laughs> so, 
he's having some Icelandic bread and cheese. High calorie food. More high calorie food. Excellent. Happiness. Drying small items over the stove is a luxury for days with surplus fuel, but our so far unnecessary plan for whole changes of sacrificial clothing we'd swap over once wet was still a potential ploy should temperatures rise. Deep snow is nice as you can dig deep down inside the floorless porch and have space to stand up, plus allowing the coldest air to drop down into the pit and away from us. And behind, it's more organised than it looks. I have managed to turn off your brother, finally. It's very difficult. We've got no signal. We've got no phone signal. No one wants to talk to us. What am I going to do without my phone? Send a message successfully to it. Because if she hasn't, she has been trying for me to send her a message. Roger. Just so. Any messages from you? Jeez. Excellent. What do you have to say about things, Stove? Ah, excellent. What do you have to say, Alex? <laughs> Nothing which anyone wants to hear. <laughs> Anyhow, we had breakfast pre-dawn, which doesn't look a great deal different, and it was time for tent down and the transition from the highland lava field to the gradual slope of the ice cap. I think we're aiming for the hill over there. Fantastic. Which hill? <laughs> the white one. <laughs> it's dark, Alex. We picked this route to minimise the chance of crevasses, and luckily there are some slightly out-of-date charts made from summer observations to identify the gnarliest spots to avoid. They are really for warning jeeps and skidoo riders, but skiers can heed the same warning. This is the ice cap, at last, mid-afternoon, and soon it was time for the sun to leave us once more for its rather elongated daily nonsense on the other side of the planet. But the three of us are not the sort to take abandonment to heart, and so we skied on further and camped. This was much more like the sort of deep snow tenting I'm used to, hundreds of times in fact, and we went for a more traditional snow wall as here it was cold and compacted enough to form blocks. Here is that uh, daybreak is over there. And we have this thing called Brad over here. Almost ready to go. Next day, we reached the high plateau at around 4,000 feet, and temperatures dipped to around minus 30 degrees, which is fine especially if it's not too windy. It was breezy, but nothing wild. We planned to climb up onto Grimsvotten, which is a regularly active subglacial volcano, and in particular the rocky escarpment to the south where the Icelandic Glaciological Society have for decades maintained some small huts. They are locked, but you can call for an entry code, and all the normal common sense about etiquette applies. We'd arrived the previous night late in the dark, and why I didn't record this I don't know, but the steep drops down into the crater were clear to see in the bright sunlight of morning. The IGS ingeniously integrated thermal ducting from the volcano to guide hot water to the huts, and although we didn't go in, apparently one of the huts has a sauna. Night fell, and we'd used the spacious comfort of the hut to sort out equipment and dry a few things. What a contrast from the warmer, wetter experience a few winters prior. A hazy morning view down south from the ridge. We'd made a decision too. Instead of heading east to one of the long narrow glaciers, we'd head south and descend one of the wider ones. The distance wasn't exceptionally different, a bit shorter, and the reason to curtail was I'm afraid one of business. I had an important speaking job in Germany coming up, and we'd taken a day longer than hoped to get to our position. Anyhow, a glacier is a glacier, as I once heard a wise sage say. Eleanor Roosevelt, probably. The wind was back, and James had fun with his GoPro as we skied at speed down the slopes back to the main plateau. I did my best with the white balance, but earlier models of GoPros don't offer a lot of latitude in these weird light conditions. As we dropped below 3,000 feet, the wind-blown ice cap had less snow cover and so less drift, even though this was midwinter. These are little peaks of turbulent glacial ice sticking up through the surface. Time for some navigation via the waypoints we had plotted from the map and crevasse charts onto our GPS, and time for a Brad selfie, naturally. We worked out our way down, avoiding the largest crevasses that were fairly obvious due to the limited snow depth, and then finally a view down towards the lowlands again, and the sea beyond. Our final night on the ice. We only had a few inches of snow here, so pitching the tent needed a casual mixing of anchoring techniques, but we decided to stay on these low slopes rather than go onto land, as we knew that there were melt rivers down there, which can swell and flood the hitherto dry areas without warning. 
It was a pleasant final evening. Warmer, less wind, time to massage tired feet and get some sleep. The next day we only had a mile or so to go on the mostly bare ice, and we enjoyed it, even as we weaved around all the menacing looking moulins, which are deep water carved holes in the ice, and as Brad's time lapse showed, our sledges really were in capsize mode for the steepening descent. A lesson I've long since learned is that a longer and sometimes wider sledge than you may otherwise think you need is a good idea. A tiny bit more sliding friction is a small price to pay for stability. All the dark marks on the ice could be the ash remains of nearby eruptions over the years, as are common on many of Iceland's ice caps, but here it's more likely just soil and dirt from the solid land and moraine that messes up the fringes of a mobile land terminus glacier. Sorry once again for the wind affected sound here, I'm saying many shrewd and worthy things. So, after I think it was a fairly challenging few days on the ice, we've had quite a mix of conditions. We are now going to step off, you actually wouldn't believe it, step off the Vatnerport ice cap onto essentially a frozen river, but officially that means that we've done our route on the ice cap from west to south. Five. Step off. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a bit late, so um, yeah. Well, my sledge has always. <laughs> we hauled across the rock and loose stones to try and find a way to a trail we hoped that would get us to the ring road. The sledges were old, and we'd accepted that the scratches from rock would mean it's their last trip. The challenge was that even recent images and charts of the Melt Rivers were out of date. The area is very dynamic and we had to skirt some powerful half-frozen rivers, but we decided to cross the one, as far as we could tell, well-frozen lake. So we've, we've just skied across a, a frozen river. Um, it's probably the most... Over a load of frozen bullshit. <laughs> it's probably the most iffy thing we've done so far, this trip. The most iffy. Uh, Straight over there. Certainly wasn't hugely comfortable when going across there. How do you feel? <laughs> As Alex said, actually fine. In the anticipation. <laughs> we made it, so we need to just carry on. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but some areas were really thin. I'd followed some pressure cracks counterintuitively as they gave me sight of the actual ice thickness so there was less guesswork. We climbed the hill to check that we could find the old 4x4 track before committing to carrying up our sledges. But success. An hour to the road and a ride back to town. So, an oldie here, rather lacking in coherent footage in some areas, I confess, but I hope of some interest. And the newspapers were kinder the second time round. That's it. Bye.